My guest tonight has the austerity and simplicity associated with many South Indian Tamils. An exceptional clarity of mind, a clear worldview. He's also self-possessed and obeying. For a republic of 940 million bidding to become a full member of the global marketplace, the arrival of Pichidambaram as India's finance minister generated fresh hope and confidence. Tonight, it's my privilege to talk to the man who is Palaniyappan Chidambaram. I'm honored to have you here, Mr. Chidambaram. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Thank you, sir. You know, we haven't met since you became finance minister, but I don't want to just catch up on that. What I want to find out more about is the journey that preceded it. So can you tell me a little bit about your early years? Well, I was born in a village, but I grew up in Madras, now Chennai. I went to school there, went to college there. What sort of a boy were you? I mean, were you very studious? Well, they said I was very studious, but I didn't think I worked very hard. <laughs> okay. Were you very, very determined as a person? Yes, I think I was. Even as a child? I think so. Stubborn? Some would say that. <laughs> what would you say? But I would say I was just determined. Did you have any goals at that time that, you know, that you wanted to achieve? No, not when I was growing up. Uh, it was a business family, so one assumed that one would go into business and when families run businesses one doesn't have individual goals one sort of assumes that the family's goals are one's goals that's right because coming from the background that you did i mean your grandfather was the raja of chetinat raja Nimalai chetiar is that right well that was a title uh, he was a king but i always say he was a king without a kingdom he was a merchant banker mm -hmm. he was a philanthropist very much so. He founded the university, which is named after him. So a title was given to him. I see. But your direct family was uh, in textiles? Business, generally. And then moved into textiles. Very modest. But in terms of uh, that age, we could call them a wealthy family. How did you choose to become a lawyer, coming from a family like this? Well, very simple. I got my degree when I was 18 and therefore I had to take another degree before I could go abroad. So I offered to do law. So I did law, went abroad, took my master's in business administration in the hope that I would go back to the family's business. Oh, I see. I came back to India. The business was too small for a father and three sons. and. Uh, I thought there was not much room for a MBA from Harvard. So I decided to go back to practice law. Were there any objections from the family or any opposition? None, because there were two other brothers and they were in business. They might have been happy to have a lawyer in the family, <laughs> so to speak. Sort of, and maybe they were happy to have me out of the way. So you went to do um, a course, uh, your MBA course in Harvard. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? Two years. And uh, what sort of an experience was it? It was great. First time that I was made to think mm. analytically. Education in India is largely uh, learning by rote. Very little thinking goes into it. And then one was pitted against quality. Mm. Everyone there was bright. Everyone there had gotten through an intense competition. Everyone had to fight one's uh, way just to keep one's place. I can understand. But I believe you really first learned how to balance a budget while you were at Harvard. <laughs> Your friends what tell you, me. What you perhaps have heard is that I was on a $7 a day allowance. That's right. That's exactly what I heard. And that you used to was skip kind, meals. That was the kind of exchange rate regime that we had. $7 a day to take care of my board, my um, hostel fees, my personal expenses. And my meals on Saturday evening, whole of Sunday, $7 a day. You went hungry. 
I didn't go hungry. On I believe you did go hungry. Well, on Sundays time. we skipped breakfast and went for the brunch in Harvard College. So you saved one meal there. And on Sunday evenings you hoped someone would invite you. <laughs> We've come a long way since. We've got $30 billion of reserves today. And any Indian student wanting to go abroad for any course gets any amount he wants. He doesn't have to go through this. Madras College, you met the girl that you decided to marry. Yeah. When was this? 1966. Mm -hmm. The very last working day of college. You met her on the last working day? Yeah. How did, and, and did you just meet her? Did you get to talking to her? No, I did. I, I knew her. I mm -hmm. She was there. One of her friends was my debating partner. Mm -hmm. So we had gone for an intercollegiate debate and she had come along. That was when I first met her and spoke to her. And then what happened? I left India and we wrote to each other for two years. Okay. So I came back and within uh, three months of my coming back, we got married. But she was outside your tight-knit community, wasn't she? She belongs to a different, uh, different community. community. Were you a family rebel in, in, in that sense? Well, her family did not. My family was opposed. Was so that didn't matter. We just went ahead and got married. Were you, is it true that you were ostracized from the family for a couple of well, years? Well, ostracized is a very strong word. Okay, what, what nine it? months. Just nine months? Yeah. And then I was always confident that things will settle down. And when my son got married early this year to a girl outside our, my community or my wife's community, uh, I don't know what community my son belongs, but when he got married to a girl outside these two communities, everyone in the family uh, sort of vied with each other to be present and to help Rejoice. in conducting the wedding. So things have changed in uh, 26 years. Then came your first foray into politics, right? 1969. We thought that we were on the threshold of a new era. The Congress Party was obvious choice at that time. I joined the Youth Congress and moved up step by step. But weren't you a leftist to start off with? Oh, yes. Um, in college, not activist, but left-oriented. So quite left, quite pronounced left wing. We even ran uh, a magazine known as Radical Review. But it's surprising coming from the family that you did, that you should even want to become a leftist. What, what was in your mind when you did that? Suppose change. That has been the one constant in my life, change. Yes. Things must change. And I thought at that time that the left ideology, which promised state intervention decisively to bring about change, uh, which promised to cast man in a new mold, mm. which promised that the state will be just, compassionate, will change things. Didn't. It didn't, and it will not, because the state is not just, the state is not compassionate. So you were disillusioned, weren't you? Not disillusioned, because I was evolving. If I had not evolved, if I had not changed, I would have been disillusioned. I know many of my friends who are unwilling to come to terms with reality are disillusioned and bitter and disappointed. Mm. I know very bitter trade union leaders. I know very bitter uh, communists. Mm. That's because they're unwilling to evolve. But what was the catalyst that made you change from a leftist to a committed reformer? I was a trade union leader. So I knew how trade unions functioned. And my own exposure to my clients, mm. many business clients. I was in administrative law. So the bulk of my work was against the state government and the central government. And the complete arbitrariness of state action how rules are made, how rules are bent, how rules are misapplied, how arbitrary, unjust, illegal orders are passed. I mean, I'm, I mean I've got quite a, a collection of uh, arbitrary orders which states can pass. Really? All that made me wonder, what is the state we're talking about? This all-powerful, um, omnipotent, omnipresent state is not an instrument in favor of change. It is the worst defender of the status quo. It's perhaps the most unjust instrument lacking completely in compassion. Uh, you, were, you were perhaps an idealist to start off with, weren't you? I'm still one. That's what I wanted to mm. ask you. Can one be just as much an idealist at 50 yes. as one is at 20? Yes, I think I'll be an idealist even at 70. 
So your, your values as such haven't changed? What you're looking for hasn't changed? No. I haven't compromised with anything so far. I haven't given a bribe to anyone. Mm. I haven't taken a bribe. I hope you believe that. I'm independently wealthy and uh, I can always earn uh, the money I want if I need to by well, practicing law. Well, that's a very important uh, asset, I think, in your political uh, career, that you always have another career to go back to. Yeah. You know, so it's I think it's very important. I tell my party workers and my constituency, start a small business, have a shop, mm. have a workshop, uh, do agriculture. Do anything. Do anything. Don't depend upon politics as a source of income. True. That is the place where corruption begins. Too true. What would you say is the, has been the turning point in your political life? 1984, when I first met uh, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. And then that was the turning point. What, w what was he like? Because um, um, When I found him an open, transparent, uh, friendly, uh, what, 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 is the best, what is the best word to describe him? Open, completely yes. open. He didn't have any baggage. <laughs> Because he came into politics late, yes. he didn't have any baggage at all. I remember when I was making um, India's Rajiv, which took a period of five years to make, um, I observed a very warm and trusting relationship between the two of you, between you and Rajivji. And I also know that politics and trust don't really often go together. But this was very apparent. Yeah, I think he placed a great degree of trust in me. He probably found me slightly different from the normal uh, young man or woman he meets in politics. Able to talk to him, chat with him, the same kind of language, same wavelength perhaps, mm. same interest in what's happening in the world. What went through you when he died? Oh, just emptiness. Suddenly there was an emptiness. You know, One had lost not only one's leader, but one had also lost one's friend. Mm. And more than that, one had lost uh, the star mm. or the force which I thought would lead India into the 21st century. He was an instinctive liberalizer and I think he, was, he would have been a superb prime minister in a second term. I had no doubt about that at all. I mean, working in this coalition government, how, there must be pulls and pressures. How do you strike a balance between your own convictions, your long-term plans, and uh, political expediency? I mean, the exigencies of political survival. Well, when I took on this job, I knew that I was taking on the job of a finance minister of a 13 or 14 yes. party coalition. I knew that. We wrote a common minimum program. When I wrote the bulk of it, everybody knows that. Yes, that's right. Now, my personal instincts and my personal philosophy goes far beyond the common minimum program. I have trimmed my sales to suit the common minimum program. It's only when I'm not allowed to implement the common minimum program that I get uh, uh, disappointed and I get impatient. I ask you, suppose you were an autocrat and not a democrat. Suppose you were a benign dictator. No holds barred. What would you do for this country? <laughs> Well, uh, I'll probably be thrown out in the first place. <laughs> no, no. I'll simply go ahead, full steam, reforming all the unreformed sectors of India. Public sector, financial mm. sector, legal reforms. Mm. There are half a dozen laws waiting for passage in Parliament. Downsizing the bureaucracy, making people accountable investing heavily in infrastructure, roads, railways, ports, power. You say there are these laws waiting to be passed in Parliament? Yes, they are. Suppose, they are suppose the company bill is there, the Sikh Industries bill is there, the income tax bill will be introduced this session. Then I have FEMA, I have money laundering bill, there are bills for power transmission. What in a party with different ideologies comes in? What happens to your economic reforms and your long-term plans? Nobody can reverse these economic reforms. Nobody can. They could slow it down, Mr. Chidambaram. And they will be thrown out for that reason. People will not accept going back to the de regime. People will not accept 
reimposition of controls, licenses, permits. Besides, the Indian economy is sufficiently integrated with the world's economy that if you try to roll back reforms, the market will punish you and discipline you. Many millions look, upon, look up to you as a future prime minister, as a potential prime minister. How do you feel about this? Well, I'm uh, touched by the thought, but uh, I don't look that far ahead. I'm quite content to do my job today. And if I don't have this job tomorrow, I won't be disappointed. It's not important whether one becomes prime minister or not. Today, you're looking at an individual here and an individual there. But I do not find a dozen men and women who share a set of values share a set of goals and whom the new generation must look upon as that critical mass which will take them. I think it's very charming, but I wanted to all ask you, why do finance ministers recite poetry during a budget speech? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose to lighten the uh, heavy uh, message that they're conveying. <laughs> but talking about poetry, you also sing, don't you? No, no, no. You do? Uh, I would, I would, I would I'd advise uh, 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 anyone who harbors uh, such, a <laughs> such a wrong notion to disabuse himself or herself. <laughs> but didn't you sing about three months ago at a meeting? I think Madeleine Albright. Oh, right, yes? this, was <laughs> this was in Kuala Lumpur. That's right. And, uh, and what did you sing? You sang Made in India? Oh, Made in India. <laughs> <laughs> I How think, did you do it? Oh, terrible. I, I, I think I was terrible. Uh, Salim Sharwani is a fine singer. Yes. I think he's outstanding. He's a, he's, a, he's a professional quality singer. There were one or two other men who could sing. I think I was the one who was off key. <laughs> uh, so what I did was I had to stand in front of the group and I pretended to sing, but uh, I don't think... You were think just doing lip sync, playback like I don't do. think there was any sound coming out, of that. <laughs> <laughs> coming out of me. Okay, and that was your first and last experience? Certainly, I, I mean, I can't sing. I can't sing if my life depended on it. <laughs> Did you learn the words at least? Well, they, uh, they, they wrote it out for me and they probably had the sheet of paper. <laughs> I believe you were, you were in a huddle and, you know, you guys were really sweating before the whole show. Yes, we were. We were all wearing batik shirts also. So, you know, we were dressed like uh, clowns and we were <laughs> performing like clowns. Okay. I believe like a true Virgo and you're also very um, obsessed with details. Is it true that you work out all the numbers, including the micro changes and excise and custom duties on your, on your little notebook PC. Is it true? On my computer, on my notebook, yes, because I think uh, God is in the details. Most mistakes are committed because people don't look into the details. I go to the last detail. I must be completely satisfied that the details have been worked out before I announce a policy. What about your leisure activities? What do you do? Um, you used to play tennis or used to play tennis very regularly, very religiously. And your son also used to play tennis. He's a much better tennis player than I. You once told me that you hoped he'd, he'd be a Wimbledon champion. He would have been if only I had told him just go and play tennis. Like all families, we ask them to study, we ask mm. them to uh, look after uh, family businesses, we ask them to play tennis. It's simply not possible. A tennis player today to reach anywhere near world class requires an exclusive coach and an exclusive court. This is available only in a foreign country. Yes, that's true. So we missed our tennis champ from India. Well, I don't think, he, uh, I mean, I don't think it have made it to the world level, but you... You never know. You never know. There are many other boys who must have missed that opportunity too. Yeah. Who's your favorite Indian cricketer? Today? Oh, of course, uh, Sachin Tendulkar. You too. <laughs> Okay. But I like uh, Ajurdin's batting. Yes. I think he bats with a great degree of majesty and authority when he's in full flow. Uh, technically, maybe Tendulkar and Gavaskar are more perfect players. Mm. But I think um, Ajurdin has, has a majesty, uh, which, one, which one saw in the Nawab of Pataudi. Some people say that, you know, you are very accessible, very normal. And some people say you're very arrogant. <laughs> I've heard that before. Why, why is, this, uh, is there this dichotomy? You should ask them. Do you think, it's a, they, uh, do you think they sense an um, intellectual sort of impatience? No, they probably want me to sit down and uh, drink cups of tea and gupshaw. I don't do that. Okay. What gives you stress? Stress? Mm. When I find people lying 
Oh, yeah. People who are petty and mean, people who have no large heart or large goals, that's very stressful to work in that atmosphere. Mm. I don't mind people who make mistakes. I make mistakes. Mm. But I cannot stand meanness, pettiness. Unfortunately, the world in which we live in, in the world in which I work in, there's a great degree of meanness and pettiness. Would you say you're a better lawyer, politician, or economist? I'm not an economist. Okay. I've learned to understand economic administration. Maybe I have learned some economics also. Okay. I'm not a very good politician. Maybe I'm a reasonably good administrator. I'm not a very good politician. Well, uh, going by the reasonable success that I achieved as a lawyer, perhaps that you can call lawyer. me a good lawyer. You know, there is a whole generation that is growing up today without role models. You know, there are no, no symbols of idealism. What kind of qualities could you instill in this next generation? What guidelines can you give them that can help them on their way to be good Indian citizens and also people of the world? It's difficult to tell a young man or woman uh, don't uh, seek money, don't seek wealth, don't seek income. That is a stupid advice to give. Uh, people must aspire to more and more wealth and income. What I would tell them is this. Lead simple lives. The wealth and simplicity are not antithetical to each other. One doesn't have to flaunt. One doesn't have to flaunt wealth or intelligence or learning or power. So true. One can remain at a lower profile. I think the most successful people are the ones who keep low profiles. And they're the ones who do the greatest amount of good and leave the greatest imprint on the rest of humanity, on the world. Well, Mr. Chidambaram, I just wish you a lot of success in your goals and your mission for India, not just for your sake, but for ours. And I want to thank you for this rendezvous. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.